officials are investigating to determine the man's identity and cause of death. This is 90.7 News. Up next, weather and traffic. The weather pattern finally begins to change starting today. From News 13, I'm meteorologist Ali Toriano. It will feel cooler out there and a northerly breeze will hold high temperatures in the upper 60s and lower 70s. Tonight, partly cloudy and mild with lows falling in the mid 50s. And by tomorrow, partly sunny skies continue with high temperatures back in the mid and upper 70s. Support for 90.7 News comes from Mid-Florida Psychiatry Center. Dr. Van Gala treats depression, anxiety, bipolar, and Alzheimer's. Mid-FloridaPsychiatryCenter.com Taking a look at the roadways with tally traffic now. Westbound I-4, a report of some slowdowns between Lake Mary Boulevard to Lee Road. Also, uh, westbound, if you're on the 408, Rosalind Ave to I-4, westbound, you can find it slow going there. This is 90.7 News. It's 10 after 7. This is Morning Edition from NPR News. Good morning. I'm Renee Montaigne. And I'm David Green. It will take tens of billions of dollars to repair the damage from Hurricane Sandy. That's just the first challenge. Scientists who study climate change say repair is not enough. As the climate warms, ice sheets and glaciers will melt, raising the sea level. That means coastal storms in the future will likely cause even more flooding. New Yorkers and scientists face a tough decision. How to spend limited funds to deal with what experts are calling the new normal. NPR's Christopher Joyce reports on that debate. New York City faces the Atlantic Ocean like a chin waiting to be hit. And Sandy stepped up and whacked it. And there will be more Sandys. Here's Jane Lubchenco, who heads the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which includes the National Weather Service. Storms today are different. Because of sea level rise, the storm surge was much more uh, intense, was much higher than it would have been in a non-climate changed world. Even garden variety storms may someday heave water up to your doorstep. So the question now is how to prepare for the next big one. Some things are a given. You can see this as you drive through Staten Island's shore neighborhoods. Many of these houses are a coin toss above sea level. Sandy knocked one-story bungalows off their foundations and flooded the rest. Repair crews go from house to house, cutting up soggy flooring and hauling away debris. Green and yellow stickers on the front doors tell a story. Yellow means the house is not inhabitable. Green means it's okay. Merritt Larson with the city's Parks and Recreation Department says most of the okay ones were built after the late 1990s when building codes changed. Zoning codes required that no utilities were in the basement, so... The utilities they, meaning you know, electrical switching boxes? That's electrical what? and gas and, and, you know, heating. Um, so whatever their uh, utilities they had had to be built on the second floor. In between houses, you can see wetlands tall reeds and twisted trees in standing water. Larson says normally they slow runoff from rainstorms, but Sandy's 10-foot high surge here overwhelmed them. Just simply the amount of water that came in and inundated these people's property, uh, you know, that couldn't be held back by these wetlands. Larson says wetlands could be useful for future storms, however, if you put them in the right place and make them big enough. Along a beach, for example, Wetlands help blunt the energy of incoming waves, but you need more. At this beachfront community, the beach is flat and narrow. It's not much help. Engineer Franco Montalto from Drexel University says it could be nourished, built up with sand or sediment to create dunes that hold back the water. And the evidence seems to be that places that had rehabilitated beaches um, suffered less damage than places that didn't. For years, the Army Corps of Engineers has built sand dunes along East Coast beaches. 